Good morning, and welcome to the Lutheran Church of Muhammad. I'm Pete Farm. I'm one of the assisting ministers here at our church, and I'm honored and privileged to bring you the message today. I'll start with our gospel acclamation. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have the light of life. John chapter 8, verse 12. Please join me in a word of prayer. God, our creator, thank you for allowing us to worship you while we are apart from each other in body, but together in spirit. Bless us with your word as we worship from a distance. Thank you for the technology and our media ministers that make this time together possible. Comfort us during this time when it is a challenge to worship in person. May your holy presence be felt as we worship in this new way. Amen. Our gospel today is from chapter 9 of the Gospel of John. It's a long one, so bear with me, but I believe I've got a captive audience. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, He spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but as someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, the man called Jesus, made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then he went and washed, and I received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisee, the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said, His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. Well, the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confesses Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? 
And he answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his, one of his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are the disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely of sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Verse 35. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him. The one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do not who do see, may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. The Gospel of our Lord. Our gospel today starts off with a question. As Jesus and his, and his disciples were walking along, the disciples says, Who sinned that this man is blind? What happened? What they're asking is, what happened that he deserved this affliction? He received this blindness. We received sickness. And Jesus tells us that no one sinned so that this man became blind, but that the glory of God's works may be shown through him. Blindness, sickness, the coronavirus, these things may be a way of God showing his works through how we react to them. In Martin Luther's day, there was the plague, almost 500 years ago now. Martin was in his home in Germany. Katie, his wife, was pregnant. They had many people living under their roof, one of which was a young woman who was pregnant. She contracted the plague. She lost her child, and she also died. But Martin Luther chose to stay and care for his people. Many of his colleagues and pastors and students were concerned and asking him what to do. So he decided to respond with a letter. Our churchwide bishop, Elizabeth Eden, shared some of her thoughts on this letter. And I encourage you to reach out and find this letter and read it uh, word for word from Martin Luther. But I'll paraphrase what the bishop shared with us last week. In 1527, the plague found its way to Wittenberg, Germany. Understandably, people were anxious and wondered what a safe and faithful response might be. In answer to this, Martin Luther wrote, whether one may flee from a deadly plague. In it, he emphasized the duty to care for the neighbor the responsibility of the government to protect and provide services to its citizens, and a caution about recklessness and the importance of science, medicine, and common sense. Luther himself remained in Wittenberg to care for his people. Luther encouraged the use of reason and medicine, writing, 
God has created medicines and has provided us with intelligence to guard and take care of the body. Use medicine, take potions which can help you, fumigate the house, the yard, the street. Shun persons and places wherever your neighbor does not need your presence. Wash your hands. Again, this is from a letter he wrote entitled, Whether One May Flee from the Deadly Plague, in 1527. In biblical times, disease and misfortune were thought to have been a result of sin or disobedience. People thought that if you did something bad, God would punish you with disease or misfortune. What did I do to deserve this? Sometimes we ask ourselves. When I came across this question about this scripture, I remember a story that I like to tell. When I was a kid, I crashed my bicycle. And I remember it like it was yesterday. I was five, six years old just learning to ride a bicycle. And I crashed. And we lived on a gravel road. So it was, it was a pretty nasty crash. I got angry. I looked up at God and I said, why, why did you allow this to happen? What did I do to deserve this? I was really upset about my scratched knees, my banged up elbows, and my scratched huffy. <clears throat> I blamed God. In this scripture, Jesus is telling us not to play the blame game. Don't blame the parents, don't blame the person for his blindness. I also remember um, other things our society has been through. Recently, 9-11 comes to mind. And how people came together and treated each other, and searched for each other, and comforted each other, and provided for each other in that time. It was a very scary time, and our world hasn't been the same since. Not long after that was Hurricane Katrina, which at the time I was a volunteer firefighter and volunteered to uh, go with our local Corn Belt firefighters and Champaign and Urbana firefighters and join Mabus 28 and uh, take a a whole slew of firefighters and EMTs to New Orleans to uh, help the community uh, recover from Hurricane Katrina and the flooding. It took us 18 hours and a whole convoy of uh, apparatus and uh, fire trucks. Sometimes when we stopped at a gas station, we couldn't even find enough fuel to fuel the trucks. It took us 18 hours to get to Baton Rouge where we replenished our supplies, got vaccinations, and got ready to make our way down into New Orleans. We got there, and we were able to provide for ourselves with the help from the government and local authorities. Things were set up in proper fashion by the time we got there two weeks later. We were able to help that community, stand guard, and make sure nothing worse came to the, to the area and protect it from fire and any other losses, as well as retrieve people from their homes and the sick and the dying and the dead. I remember being stationed on uh, Bourbon Street, very near to the Ninth Ward. Sitting down to lunch with a local firefighter, he said, this had to happen, which really shocked me. He was a local firefighter, lived in the area. This was his community. He said, this town needed a good flush. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, there's a lot of injustice and a lot of corruption in this community. We could use another good flush. I was really shocked by that. He loved his community, but he realized that sometimes something drastic has to happen to bring out the injustices in a community. We were stationed there for two weeks, and sometimes when we were off duty, we would do what we call stealth missions. We would uh, find a local family, maybe an EMT or a paramedic or a fighter, fire, fighter, fire, firefighter and paramedic or paramedic, and go to their homes and help them clean out what got wet, what was under the flooded waters, and save what we could of their home and their belongings. So one afternoon, we went out and did a stealth mission. We went to a young man's home who was a local paramedic, walked in the front door, and everything was wet, of course, from three foot down. So we started taking up the flooring, 
taken out the drywall, taken out their belongings. Antiques, chairs, bedding, kids' toys, clothes. And as we were doing this, I look up on the dresser and see a menorah and a Star of David. And I realized I had traveled 18 hours in a fire truck to help God's chosen people. In the weeks after Katrina, we heard stories of heroism and help and communities coming together, no matter what creed, color, nationality, or religion, helping each other recover from this devastating event. Those stories got told, and we remember them now. We're right now in the midst of the coronavirus. And right now, the stories we're hearing is how devastating it is and what we can do to prevent it and how we can help each other by staying distant from each other. But we can look forward to those stories being told after the fact. What heroism was done during, before, after. Hopefully we'll have some of those harrowing stories. I know we will. But right now, we're hunkered down, distancing, distancing ourselves from each other for each other's good. Who's to blame? Who's to blame for the coronavirus? China, the government, the labs, bat soup, pangolins? I've learned from my son that a pangolin is like a smaller, cuter armadillo. The New York Times had, the New York Times had a headline that says, Revenge of the Pangolins. Some research finds that pangolins carry the coronavirus. But we can't play the blame game. In this text, Jesus says, don't play the blame game. This happens so that God's work, God's glory may be revealed. The Pharisees are upset. Why are they upset? Jesus wasn't playing by the rules. You're supposed to distance yourself from others on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to heal or work or reach out to your neighbor. Jesus did it anyway. The blind man was questioned. Who did this? How did he do it? What day did he do it? The blind said, I don't know who he is. I just know that I can see. He healed me. His parents were questioned also. Was your son truly blind at birth? Who healed him? How did he do it? And the parents, out of fear of the authority, said, I don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He can answer for himself. They were afraid of being kicked out of the synagogue, not being able to socialize with their church family. The man says in verse 25, I don't know if he is a sinner or not, but he fixed me. The blind man also explains in verse 30, here is an astonishing thing, and you are arguing about the day and who it is who performed this miracle. The blind man puts the authorities to the test and said, do you want to be his believer too? At that, they shunned him and drove him out of the synagogue. Jesus hears of this and finds him. I'll read directly from the scripture because I really can't say it a better way. Verse 35. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you now. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into the world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked him, What, are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. 
But now that you claim that you can see, your guilt remains. Excuse me. What is the Lord telling us through this Gospel of John? I don't know for certain, but I'd like to think it's this. We are not going through a pandemic or an attack or a hurricane or a crash or a financial crisis because we are sinners or because we are bad and need punishment. God loves us and wants us to prosper and always protects us. We go through these trials so the love of God and that God's works may be revealed. We will see the love of God in our doctors, in our nurses, in our first responders, our clergy, and our lay ministers, and farmers, grocers, restaurant staff, truck drivers, retailers, village workers and administrators, landlords and bankers, all of those who work on the front lines of this latest crisis. Let us pray for them and all who are in this together around the globe right now. Dear God, thank you again for allowing us to spread your word in new ways. Be with those who risk their own health for those at risk of the dreadful virus. As we shelter at home, guide us to reconnect with people dear to us. We remember that your son is the light of the world. And at the end of this, we would be more acutely aware of that light. And we are to reflect that light. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.